When Ella Watson Stryker boarded a plane for, to Switzerland from New York last spring, she knew she was on her way to combat a mysterious fever outbreak in Africa. She was a volunteer with Doctors Without Borders. When the team arrived in Switzerland, the lab results were in. It was Ebola. Over the next year, Watson Stryker was in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, tracing the disease contacts from rural village to rural village. Her job was trying to explain to people how to respond to a terrifying illness, convincing families to give over their loved ones to the care of people shrouded in alien-looking protective gear. She was on the cover of Time as the face of the Ebola fighter, 2014's Person of the Year. And now she's here with Mary Louise Kelly to tell her story. Hello again, everybody. Ella, I wonder if you would start at the beginning. That story that he just alluded to, you got a call on a Thursday afternoon telling you to get on a plane. It was, you knew it had to do with a viral outbreak. Two days later, you were on a plane. It was not until you landed that you knew the virus was Ebola. What went through your mind? Um, I actually changed planes in London. And when I got off the plane in London, I turned on my phone and saw that I was going to an Ebola outbreak. And the first thing I think that went through my mind is to look at the board of flights departing back for New York. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, you know, you start to think through things and be a bit rational and realize that I chose to work with Doctors Without Borders because I trust them, because they have expertise and that there were already people in the field and they were already working and they would need more help. So, What, what did you know about Ebola at that point? I knew You're almost, not trained as a doctor. I'm not trained as a doctor. I have a background in public health. Uh, the extent to which I had studied Ebola in my public health class was an infectious disease class where the professor said, well, I've taught you everything about malaria and tuberculosis and HIV. If you're ever in the field and you hear about an Ebola outbreak, just run the other way. <laughs> So my image of Ebola was sort of the movie image of people bleeding from every opening in their body. Um, I thought the fatality rate was 100%. Um, it is pretty close to that at times. But I knew very, very little about it. And this was your first mission overseas with Doctors Without Borders. It's, yes. It's a hell of a first assignment. It was a steep learning curve. Uh, I had worked before in West Africa and in Southeast Asia. Um, on a variety of different health programs, but I, it was the first time I worked with Doctors Without Borders and it was the first time I worked in Ebola. I know it must be almost impossible to convey to an audience here in New York, sipping lattes on a beautiful spring day, what it was like, what you flew into, and then returned to over and over and over. But I want to ask you to try. And you've brought, you've brought some pictures to help illustrate what you were seeing as you got there and, and the kind of things you were dealing with. This first image, tell us what we're looking at, where it is, what we're seeing. So the first image is of a small child being led into the Ebola treatment center. So this child has been examined uh, in the triage. And you see the orange fencing is creating a distance between the clinician who will do a verbal and visual examination and people who are potentially sick. So then in order to take care of someone who's positive for Ebola, you have to wear specialized clothing so that the health workers don't become sick. So they're leading this child um, into the center. This is, for me, one of those photos that really, I think, if you, if you look at it from this side, you see a child alone and being accompanied by people who are strangers to her and who are dressed in a way that creates a lot of fear. And then imagine if you were a parent and this is your child. And I don't think anyone in this room who's a parent would feel comfortable with their child being in this situation and knowing that your child is being led into a place you cannot follow. And, and that's why we had such a difficult time engaging communities and addressing this outbreak. 
I mean, it, it's exactly what went through my mind when you said it's, it's that orange netting is, is keeping back people who might be infected, which is the families. How hard was it to, to get them to trust you? I mean, I'm looking, those people are terrifying looking in those outfits to a child, to parents, to anyone. It's even when I know the people who are in the costumes, in the, the protective clothing, it's even off-putting for me. So you can imagine from a child's perspective or from any, the perspective of any human being, this is something that's dehumanizing. And especially when you're sick, when you're afraid, the last thing you want is to be confronted with this kind of situation. Just one more thing before we leave this photo, which is there's the big handwritten list showing what, what, showing what symptoms to look for. And I guess you're reminding the health workers, also educating the people mm -hmm. on the other side of that orange fence. Is that right? This list is really for the health workers okay. because we had to move really quickly in expanding um, our operations. And it meant that we were hiring local staff who'd never worked with Ebola before. It meant that expatriate staff like myself were going to Ebola for the first time. The biggest problem in this outbreak was lack of human resources. We didn't have enough people on the ground to respond to the scope of the outbreak. And so we had to create a lot of signage that would help people to remember, OK, this is the case definition. Case definition for Ebola is very broad. A lot of different diseases fall inside that same case definition. It's a lot of information to keep in your head. No. OK. Let's tell us, where is this? This is in Liberia? This, yeah, this okay. is um, Monrovia, Liberia. Um, this was, I was in Monrovia for my third Ebola mission, and this is the Ebola management center there. It looks like an industrial complex um, where you see tents. Those are where we did patient care. So if you look, you can see the main road, and there was a gate there that people could enter from, and then they would go through a triage. Those who met the case definition for Ebola then would be admitted first to an area where they would be tested, and if they tested positive, they would be then admitted into one of the many tents that was there. Um, when I saw this for the first time, for me, it was shocking. I had worked in other Ebola centers that felt like, well, the first one I worked in was two tents. It felt like a house. And the second one was set up for um, 80 patients when I got there. It was the largest at the time. It was the largest treatment center for Ebola that had ever been constructed. And it looked to me like a village of tents. But this looked like a factory. And we had to build enough bed space for 400 Ebola patients. It's a different scale than anything anyone had ever done before. There was no blueprint for this. We had to create everything from scratch. To build something of that scale. All right, talk us through this. This is health workers knocking mm -hmm. at someone's home. Great. Right. So if someone tests positive for Ebola, it means that all of the body fluid is potentially also contaminated with the virus. Anything that they've touched, a cup that they used, a plate that they ate off of, the clothing that they wore, the bedding that they used, all of that could be contaminated. And that means anyone sharing a house with them could also become infected indirectly through contact with those items. Uh, so one of the responses in an Ebola outbreak is to actually decontaminate the living space of someone who's tested positive. These are water and sanitation experts who have been trained specifically to decontaminate these houses. And I think it speaks to how difficult it is for the community to be in a situation where this assembly of people shows up at your house. And so part of the work that I was doing in health promotion was to be able to go first to the village and make those human contacts, to build trust with people in advance, and then also to be there with the team that was doing their job, because their job is incredibly difficult and incredibly dangerous. This weather was usually around 100 degrees, and they are sealed into plastic, multiple layers of plastic. It's very, very hot. And they don't have a lot of time to stand around and explain things. So that was my job. And I worked with a lot of very, very brave and dedicated uh, local staff who spent hours and hours explaining what we were doing, why we were doing it, and gaining the permission of the community for us to be able to do this work. And we should note you've brought one of these suits 
If anybody's interested in actually seeing it and feeling it and, and touching it, it's downstairs on the second floor next to the exchange stage. At it's the, at the brand NSF new. Board. It has no Ebola on it. <laughs> Thank you. Good. This is you. Mm -hmm. And tell us who you're talking to. So this is in Sierra Leone, and I'm talking to the paramount chief of a village called Daru. The paramount chief. The paramount chief. So Sierra Leone has a political system that's organized on both a representative democracy and on a traditional chiefdom level. And these two forms of government work together. The paramount chief of Daru is a very important man in his community. He's extremely influential and very, very well respected. So he was a key ally for us. He was the person that we went to when we had a problem and we needed help. And he was also very personally touched by the virus. A lot of people in his village got sick and died from the virus, including his wife, who was a nurse. He lost a lot of family members and a lot of friends. And the, the health center in Daru actually lost multiple health staff, uh, including nurses, midwives, the um, chief health officer, and lab workers, and the ambulance driver. So. Mm -hmm. They were, they were a community that knew that the, the, they knew what this virus could do, and they were very focused on making it stop. And so any time that someone survived Ebola, it, for us, it was the best moment in the field. But sometimes going home was really difficult because people were afraid, and they didn't know if the person could infect them, they didn't know if they were still contaminated with the virus. And so we would meet with people like the Paramount Chief and explain this person is, is no longer sick, please welcome them back and encourage them to shake the person's hand in front of the whole community and, and to really welcome the person back. Because the fear was that they were carrying the virus home and so it, that even the survivors were not being exactly. welcomed back home. You've written that some days it felt like you were fighting a forest fire with a spray bottle. Um, and we all, as we followed the story from, from here in the U.S., have, have followed the accounts of how the international response in the early, was very late right. and inadequate. What was it like as you were watching it from the ground, um, watching the world react or, or, or not um, in the early months that you were there? Um, it was really difficult. It was really difficult to be in a situation where... Um, we didn't have enough of anything. In the beginning, there weren't enough people, there weren't enough vehicles, just we didn't have enough. And we asked for help and we asked for help and the answer was silence. And it wasn't until the summer months when the first American doctor and nurse um, who were working in Liberia were infected that it felt like anyone cared. And all of a sudden, white people from a rich country were affected, and all of a sudden, it mattered. And the resources started and, pouring in? And resources started to trickle in. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not easy for people to go and spend a few weeks or months of their life fighting Ebola. Uh, so human resources were always, and still are, a challenge. Um, it's not that everyone can just get on a plane and go. It takes specialized training and experience. Um, and, and then it's also the matter of organizing. This was an unparalleled epidemic. This had never come, this had never even come close to happening before. Before, if 100 people died of Ebola, it was a major outbreak. And, and 11, so far, 000, we think, more than 11,000. Yeah. And that's a dramatic underestimate. There are villages in Sierra Leone that are gone, and no one's counted the number of deaths. This, this is a question to which the answer is maybe unknowable, but from your personal vantage point, do you think lessons have been learned from this particularly horrific experience, 11,000 lives lost, that will prevent it from happening, or at least happening on this scale again? I hope so. I think, I think it's hard to learn these kinds of lessons because there's no easy answer to this. The reason this happened is because there's not, there aren't functioning health systems in a lot of the world. And what happened in Guinea is that the virus circulated for a long time, for months. And it was when a Guinean doctor died that they said, wait, there's something happening here and we need to investigate. And so as long as we live in a world where we choose to allow villages 
that are in remote areas where poor people are affected to die of diseases and we choose to say that doesn't matter, that's not important, then it's really hard to change the system that allows this kind of outbreak. People have to have a functioning health system. When someone gets sick, it has to be reported somewhere so that it's not dismissed as cholera or a normal illness that we know how to deal with. I want to squeeze in one question, one last question to build on that, which is just, do you feel hope? You've been four times over the last year. You just came back at the end of March. And as you know, Ebola has largely faded from the front pages of the headlines here for good reasons. They've declared an end to the epidemic uh, in one of the affected countries, in Liberia, and the number of reported cases is down in the other two main countries that have been, that have been affected. Do you feel like we've turned a significant corner here? I, th I hope that the worst is behind us. I hope that we're not in a situation where hundreds of people are dying every week, where there's hundreds of new infections each week. Um, but in the week of May 17th, there were 35 new cases of Ebola that we know of. Uh, 27 of them were in Guinea. They're in multiple different areas of Guinea and Sierra Leone. Of the 27 in Guinea, one-third are cases where we don't know how the person got sick. So we still don't have the epidemiological data that we need to stop this outbreak. And a lot of people are now thinking, this isn't an outbreak. This is an endemic disease to this area. This isn't going to end in a month or two months. This is going to be there in the region at a low level. And if that's the case, then we have to respond in a different way. Okay. All right, we have to leave it there. Ella, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.